All right, I think I got it up. Can you guys see the slides? Yep, we can. Woo. All right, great. Okay, let's do slideshow. Welcome to WPAC. Um, sorry for the problems. I'd reused this before on this machine and I have no idea what happened. Um, so in any event, we're actually a working group, so that's great. Thank you very much. My name's Sean. My other co-chair is? Oh, hi, David Lawrence. David Lawrence. So I'm going to run the slides today off my laptop. Dave's going to um, manage the queue, as I guess as he mentioned. Um, let's get into it. So this is the meeting tips that you've probably been staring at for the last 10 minutes while I futzed around with my laptop. Um, please make sure your video is off. Mute your microphone unless you're speaking. Um, use your headsets to avoid echo. Um, please use the WebEx chat only to join the mic queue. Um, please add your name to the virtual blue sheets and um, join the Jabber for other various back channel discussions. Uh, here's the note well. Please make sure you understand that we are recording this. Let's be con, con and courteous to, to everybody. Um, hopefully you've seen a couple of these because you've been dialing into other sessions. Um, here's a request. We got uh, Ted volunteer to do uh, the Jabber session, but we don't have a minute taker, or did I miss that? Uh, you nobody has yet volunteered for a minute. All right. So now we have the pause while we uh, wait for someone to volunteer. I would love to be able to see the uh, um, to see the list of people, but unfortunately, I'm full uh, full screen. Does anyone want to volunteer? Jabber PWU said yes. Yeah. Great, thanks. PWU is, oh, Peter Wu. Okay, thank you, Peter. All right, great. So again, um, the other thing is that we need to do is when at the microphone or when you come off mute, please make sure to state your name and let's keep it professional. So here's our agenda. Um, basically, we put this together. We had, um, we weren't quite a working group, so we were going to do administrivia and then do some use cases and then jump into the protocols. Um, the chairs actually think that we could maybe agenda bash the use cases out of the out of this now, because basically we were just going to read the charter. Um, so we're not sure that we really need this, and maybe we could give this five minutes back, um, considering that I ate 10 minutes trying to futz around with my laptop. Are there any objections to that? All right, great. So I guess what we're going to do is we're going to jump right into the web bundle. Um, and let me see if I can find that. There it is. All right, Jeffrey, um, let me know when you need me to. Um... I will say next slide when I need the next yep. slide. And that confirms that you can hear me. Um, OK. So I'm Jeffrey Askin. Um, thanks everyone for coming. Thanks, the ch thanks to the chairs for volunteering to chair. Um, this is kind of a description of the, the work that we've done and the, the design sketch that we have in, in this bundled exchanges um, draft. Um, none of this is final. Um, I'll describe at the end what Chrome has implemented so far, but uh, treat that as a prototype, um, as a way to gather evidence rather than Kind of solidifying what what has to happen. Um, okay, go to the next slide. So the general semantics of a bundle are that it's a sequence of bytes or a file that uh, might be retrieved from a URL, might be stored on local disk, um, kind of whatever. Um, it contains a set, um, which sometimes I've been thinking of as a cache of HTTP-like resources. Each resource, like an HTTP, is addressed by a URL, and there's some support in the in the format for content negotiation. Um, right now, uh, expressed with Mark Nottingham's variance headers, um, but that has changed at least once in in the evolution of the format and could change again um, to select a representation. Um, there's also some bundle-wide metadata. The bundle starts with a prime with a, a the URL of a primary resource. 
which is used um, by a client. If someone navigates to the bundle, they actually load that primary resource. Um, if the client can't parse the whole bundle, it can redirect to that resource. Um, so that's kind of the, the required bit of metadata. And then there's, there's another field where you can stick the, the URL of, a re, of an internal resource that's something like a web app manifest or the EPUB package document or some other manifest-like um, metadata format um, that, that can allow, um, allow the, the client to do something more intelligent with the contents of the bundle. Next slide. The, a resource inside a bundle um, is addressed by a full URL. Um, so there's, there's some authority inside that, that URL. Um, the resource might be authoritative for the URL um, and HTTP defines um, or uses this notion of an authoritative response. Um, and there's, there's several conditions that might cause the resource to be authoritative. Um, the one that I think is, is pretty safe is if the bundle was retrieved from the same, the same HTTPS origin. Um, and um, if you're familiar with service workers, you, you might have heard of, the, of a path restriction there. We should have the same path restriction here. Um, other ways of establishing authority we'll talk about super important for this presentation. Uh, next slide. So now we, we have this kind of goal to have a format. There's a lot of formats out there. Um, we need to make sure that we're not just kind of adding to the pile that there's that either we reuse an existing one or there's some compelling reason to, to design something new. Um, and right now I think there's compelling reasons to design something new, but we should always be kind of, as we refine the needs in this working group, we should always be paying attention to the possibility that, that will eliminate a requirement and that will allow us to, to reuse something. Um, next slide. Um, so some of the, the properties of the current design. Um, we're, we're trying to make it secure. Um, we're trying to make it extensible. We're trying to make it um, usable in a random access way and to, to load uh, the content in a streaming way. And I'll describe the, what those mean in the next couple slides. So next slide. So we want to make the format secure, which means minimizing the probability of implementation errors. Um, this isn't about kind of the cryptography involved. This is about kind of memory safety and, and ease of implementation. Um, so for instance, uh, zip allows implementations to read, um, to make at least two kinds of mistakes in picking what the name of a resource is. Um, they, can, uh, they can read it from the resource header instead of the global index, and they can pick the, the first instead of the last or the last instead of the first a copy of a name from that, that index, and that has caused security, security vulnerabilities. Um, so we don't want, we don't want to do that. Um, we want to make the format easy to parse, uh, don't, don't have a lot of kind of choices um, in the format, which would increase implementation complexity. Um, I don't claim that, that the format is kind of meets this goal perfectly, um, but it's, it's kind of the, a design goal that, that we trade off, that we should trade off uh, kind of changes in the format against. Next slide. Um, the current format is extensible by adding new metadata sections. Um, this is similar to a bunch of other formats like ping and JFIF. Um, and the current support for signatures are done as an extension section. They're kind of a side, side piece of the format rather than integrated into the whole thing. Um, next slide. Um, so we want it to be random access. Um, that is, we want to minimize the number of bytes that we have to read in order to, to pull out an arbitrary resource um, instead of requiring um, that, that you always read a prefix of the format. Um, next slide. Um, and we also want to be able to stream a load of the resource. Um, so read as few bytes from the prefix as, as you can before you can start using the first resources within the bundle. Um, the, the index that's in there to support random access uh, compromises this goal some, um, but it, it seems to be acceptable so far, um, but we can, can certainly revisit it. 
Um, next slide. One, one property that we don't have is that a is to allow a server to stream the generation of a bundle. Um, and uh, the charter also kind of doesn't explicit or not explicitly, but intentionally skips this possible property. Um, and in order to get it, we would have to, to get rid of, of at least one of the other um, properties. Um, so there's, there's several ways to do it, but, but we would have to sacrifice something. Um, and if people want that, then we, we should talk about making one of these sacrifices and, and pick the, the sacrifice we want to make. Um, so next slide. So one of the questions that we run into in uh, in using bundles is how do we how do we name the contents of the bundle? Um, so on this slide is is a sketch of a, a URL scheme or URI scheme that that might work. Um, it includes both the um, URL of the bundle and the the URL of the of the resource inside the bundle, um, structured in a way that that the the important parts wind up in the in what a, a web browser would parse as the origin. Um, there's a question of whether we can use the a package colon slash slash URL or we have to use package colon um, that that I think we'll we'll discuss more um, in the future. Um, and then uh, we we want to assign a web origin to all of these resources. Um, my initial thought had been to assign the origin as the the URL. Um, it's also possible to do an origin uh, based on the content of the of the resource, um, and it's important to avoid having to to hash the whole thing. So we we probably would use something like Martin Thompson's um, Merkle Integrity uh, hash system. Um, but again, that's that's something that we can work out in the future. the The critical thing is that we need a way to to address the contents and and a web origin for those contents. Um, let's see. Next slide. So these are these are partially implemented for some use cases in Chromium. Um, it's currently possible to navigate to a bundle, um, and there's a, a web.dev article describing how you do that and giving some some demos. Um, we're working on being able to load sub resources from a bundle. Um, so this is things like. Uh, provide all of the images on a page in one download, or provide um, a JavaScript module tree in one file. Um, this this is intended as as a possible output format for things like Webpack and Parcel JS, um, and so that's we're prototyping that and measuring what the what the effect is. Um, and we'd uh, love to get more input on uh, kind of what what you want us to test um, and kind of help with with trying this out and figuring out what, what works and what doesn't work. Um, next slide. <clears throat> so there's a bunch of questions. This is probably not all of them. Um, so um, one, one piece of skepticism we've gotten is um, within a bundle, do we actually need things to be named by full URLs or can we name them by just paths? Um, do we actually need content negotiation inside a bundle or could we, could we use just a URL and then a response? And assume that that the re, the uh, representation at a URL is unique. Um, should we separate the streamable format from the random access format? Um, so if we have either two different formats or um, or two options within the format, um, it can let us uh, be a little more optimal for both at the cost of implementation complexity. And the question is whether that's worth it. And then the the URLs and origins. Um, for the resources still still need a lot of design and and people who know about URLs, uh, it would be nice to to tell us whether we've done it right or whether there's a better way to do it. Um, I don't think we're trying to come to any firm conclusions at this meeting. This is just kind of things to start talking about, um, looking for stuff to pay attention to, um, and and looking for people to to help draft uh, kind of the answers to these questions. Um, so that's that's the last slide for this. Um, we should we should talk. Eric, Chris Corlo, please. Hey, Jeffrey. Um, you said something about um, uh, random access. I'm trying to figure out what the desirable random access properties you have are. Um, 
namely, uh, so I heard you say that you should be able to, um, you know, access a subsection um, without having to like skim through, through the entire, um, you know, um, the entire bundle, or at least on average half the bundle. Um, and I thought I heard you say something about being able to use pieces of subsections without reading the entire subsection. Um, it, did, I, did I hear you correctly? Let's see. So there's... Like say, you know, you've got a bundle, like uh, there's an a, a, a image halfway through, right? And I want to yeah. just render the image, right? Um, or, what, or what point do you think I should be able to use the image? Right. Um, so the design so far has been that you should be able to go straight to an image. Uh -huh. And then you should you should have to read the prefix of the image to start um, to start using it. Uh -huh. um, and um, if these if these things are have some sort of integrity attached, um, I've been using Martin Thompson's Merkle integrity to allow you to read just the first chunk before you start using it. If there's no integrity and no signature, you could probably you can probably just read the first bytes and use that. Um, I have not been uh, trying to let you read kind of the the last half um, sure. and then use just that last half. There are there are potentially some use cases around video that and and kind of very large resources that might benefit from that. But what I've heard from people who do video is that they're already used to chopping up the videos into small files, and so it's it's not actually yeah. a requirement for that use case. Yeah, agree. Okay. I actually don't see the. Uh, I mean, I agree that Merkle tree is pretty much the way you have to do the individual pieces, but I don't actually see that in your spec. Is that just missing, or am I just like not reading very carefully? The um, so the only the only time you actually use the Merkle trees is when you're checking the integrity or authenticity of this thing. Um, yes. And so so the that shows up in the signatures section, but not in the in the fundamental bundles uh, bundling work. Oh, okay. Um, I'll, I'll I'll skim through it, but I I, I understand what you're trying to call. I think I think the important thing is is that we should probably get some consensus on whether it's important to be able to start processing subcomponents before reading the entire subcomponent. That's probably something we should because that, that adds substantial additional complexity to so decide if we think it's valuable or not. Okay. Thanks. Yeah. It it seems to be valuable for at the very least HTML resources. Um, so, so I'm lobbying for for considering it valuable, but I'm happy to get more feedback on that. Yeah, I mean, obviously, otherwise you have to quarantine off the thing for side effects. Yeah. Murray, please. Hey, um, just real quick, can you expand a bit on what that second bullet means? I'm still coming up to speed here a little bit, and that's the only one that stood out to me is, huh? Right. Um, so you could have several different representations at one URL using um, I'm using the HTTP terminology, which is not not universal. So um, that is, if you have both like an image and and a HTML page at the same URL that you use the accept header to to pick between, um, or if you have two different languages at the same URL that you use accept language to pick between, um, or gzip and and bz2 or um, or whatever. Um, do we want to support that, or do we want to force people who produce bundles to just assign different URLs to the different uh, the different kinds of resources or representations at a single uh, URL? Okay, thanks. It was a terminology then. Okay, uh, thank you, Jeffrey. That was the end of the mic queue. So from a chair's perspective, understanding this is the early days of the working group, what we're looking at trying to figure out with this draft is whether this is kind of a good starting spot for the working group to begin its work. So we're not going to do that call immediately, but that's how people should be thinking about looking at this draft because there's not, not something that really else is coming along um, that, that's essentially you know, like where we're trying to pick between the two. So in the, in the coming weeks and months, I guess, people should think about whether this is a draft where we, we want to start from. All right, now, here's here. Uh, hang on, uh, Martin has uh, some final comments. Uh, Martin's yeah. on. Yeah, so there's a bunch of things here that Jeffrey covered that I'm, I'm not certain fit within the, the spec, or we might have to make some decisions about whether it fits within the spec. But, oh, absolutely. Um, that, 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 as it's currently framed, um, I don't know that we really have enough time here to talk about whether um, it's appropriate to have some concept of URIs or identification for, for these things in, integrated. 
Um, we obviously just had a discussion about how integrity interacts with this sort of thing. Mm -hmm. That too, I think, is an important discussion to have, but it may be a separate thing. Who knows? Oh, no, Martin, I absolutely agree. I think what we have is this draft and how we would carve it up um, and what parts stay and what parts don't is the discussion we're going to have in the coming weeks and months. All right. All right, I'm going to switch over here. Sorry, I think I'm back in the queue, uh, as right. I was hoping I was. Um, mm -hmm. Eric, scroll again. Um, yeah, I mean, I think that the uh, um, there's a conceptual sort of question here, which is what the relationship uh, is of the stuff in the bundle to stuff outside the bundle. And I think that, that, and they, that partly that partly dictates, you know, Martin's question about like the URLs and partly other things. So, like hypothetically speaking, you know. Um, you know, so, so, so as a concrete example, you could say, well, you know, I've got like a web page um, and then it's got a bunch of like, you know, and the, like so, so one classic way to build an app, right, is you've got like a giant like tarball of like supporting garbage. And then you have like a master web page which loads it up. And often like if you're like using Django or something, then you like pull in, you know, like interpolate JavaScript, um, interpolate values into the master web page that has to be, has to be like, that has to be like, um, you know, um, online generated, but everything else can be static, right? And so... So one well, one like super important question is like, does stuff in the bundle enter the cache and they get referenced by references in that in that in that, in that generated thing? And I think that that's probably the that's probably the the the, the 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 use case function that force factors how you reason about like some of the questions Martin was raising. Is you know, should we think of this as like oh this is like a thing like a book and it doesn't have like it's like self-contained or should we think of this as a thing that is like you know is like Kind of like more like HTTP push, right? Um, right, Jeffrey. Did you want to address that? I see you yes. added yourself to the queue. <laughs> <laughs> Sorry, I wasn't sure if I was like standing at the front of the room or or in the mic queue. You're still basically right. at the front of the room. You can address the. <laughs> um, yeah. So so my. My goal has been to to make it possible that uh, you you take the stuff in a bundle and you kind of trust it as as coming from the um, from the authoritative server. Um, and for for things at the same path uh, or things within things under the same path, that that seems pretty safe. Um, but it is something that we'll have to have to come to consensus on on whether we actually want to do it. Um, for for a lot of the the pure bundling use cases, I think we do. I think it is useful to to stick it in the cache and treat it and let it interact with stuff outside the bundle. Okay, uh, you'll have white space. Um, yeah, so um, I think that. Um, it's basically essential for some of the use cases to to be able to interact with the resources that are in the bundle outside of it. Um, I'm mostly thinking about the roll-up slash webpack uh, use case, where we will be able to bundle different JavaScript resources instead of what's currently being done by tools, turning them into one big JavaScript chunk. So in order for us to get benefits from that use of web bundles, I think we would need to have them be addressable outside of the bundle. Jeffrey, any comments on that? I think uh, we'll wrap up this and move on to the next presentation, unless you want to respond. Nope, that, that matches my beliefs. Okay. So uh, Sean is bringing up the next. Yeah, so we've we've had a little bit of discussion on the list um, for a, a counter proposal to the um, the signed exchanges draft, um, and this this is kind of a reframing of of what what the signed exchanges draft does um, in the context of of bundles and and um, in the context of what what pieces are are contentious um, so this is this is a way of establishing authority for um, for a resource inside a bundle 
um, that is based on signatures. Um, so let's go to the next slide. So two of the goals that we that we established um, for uh, in in the charter were that we should be able to establish kind of a, a user level authenticity of of content, and that users should should have a continuous experience between things they got offline and things that they do online. Um, so let's go to the next slide. Um, so authenticity, uh, is the way that I'm talking about it, is that the user gets a piece of content while they're offline. They um, may, might get it from their friend. They might get it um, maybe from a web server that's closer to them or that they've already been interacting with um, rather than going directly to the origin. Um, and they need to know what, where the content came from in a, in a way that they, they understand. They need to know whether they can trust the content. Um, and, and there's a caveat here. Um, there was a, a presentation at uh, Enigma Conf last year um, that URLs are not actually good at expressing authenticity to users. Um, users don't, don't really understand what, what a URL means. But uh, they're what we have, and we're fixing them for the online case. So, so providing them for the offline case would, would at least get that to parity with, with what we're doing while online. Um, next slide, please. Um, the, the continuity of experience is about a user who gets a piece of content while they're offline. They use it some, uh, they, they save some, some local state. Um, maybe they, they compose an email in, their, in this email application they got on, offline or, or they draw a picture or, or whatever. Um, and then they go online and they want to be able to send bits of that state over the internet, um, which means that the state needs to be accessible to the, to the online version of the app. Um, and then they go back offline and they get a new version. Um, and then they, they want to keep editing the content that they created um, using this new version. And then they go back online and they want to send it to the online origin again and, and so on. Um, and so having, having a, um, uh, sorry, go to the next slide then. Um, so the, the solution that, that I've been proposing um, is to have someone sign the content um, with, with some, some private key, check, have existing certificate authorities check that, that the person who owns that private key is the same one who owns a particular domain, um, and then give the, give the thing they signed an origin of that domain. So give them, if you, if you know how to sign things as a domain, then your content can be, um, can be trusted as that domain. Um, next slide. Um, so this has this has a bunch of downsides in addition to the to the upsides. Um, it allows off-path attackers. Um, it means that users might might continue using content that the author would like to have revoked. Um, there's a pile of security considerations in the draft. Um, there's a, a logistical problem with then updating the signatures. So next slide. Um, so. Normally, an attacker who gets a, a TLS private key that they shouldn't have still has some logistical challenges in actually attacking people with it. Um, they have to they have to intercept the user's DNS request or or somehow get get on the path between the user and the the actual site. If you get a signed exchange private key, you avoid all of those challenges. You can just attack people. Um, next slide. Um, Content that, that is out of date or that is buggy in some way um, can, can still be used. So a signature proves that, that the signer vouched for it at some point. A TLS proves that they're vouching for it now. Um, we limit signatures to seven days, uh, to a maximum of seven days um, to, to partially uh, avoid this problem, but it's not complete. And it also introduces a whole pile of other problems, um, one of which I will talk about on the next slide. Um, so that seven day limit means that you have to re-sign content about every three days. Um, that, that gives you, gives the distributor three days or so to pass it on to users and allows users to have about a day of clock skew, um, which is distressingly common. Um, 
And then there needs to be some structure for you for clients to grab updated signatures so that they can send it to their peers um, within this within that uh, couple day time frame. Um, and and we really like to be able to avoid that somehow. Um, so so we've got this kind of relatively simple to think about system um, <clears throat> in which kind of if you sign something, then it it can act as you. Um, and there's this pile of downsides. Um, and so um, I want to take questions on the next slide um, about kind of any details of this. But then Martin's going to talk about a counter proposal um, that I think is is complementary in a lot of ways. Um, and so we we can then uh, talk about the the trade offs um, after after his presentation. So yeah, any questions? Uh, no, the mic cue has been clear. So now's your chance, though. Last call before we move on to the next. Okay, Martin, it looks like you're up. So I apologize for not being able to keep up with the Java chat and Jeffrey at the same time. So I may have missed something there. There's a bunch of questions here that I think are really important. And um, I probably should have had some comments on that last one. But anyway, um, this is, I guess, an alternative refra reframing of the, the problem space. Uh, next slide, please. OK, so um, as a bit of a review, the um, current web security model depends on TLS connections. Um, we have these things called service workers that aim to support the transition from an online state to an offline state. Often that's just a, um, uh, a periodic thing. Um, so to, people use them to deal with temporary glitches in, in connectivity. Um, there's not a lot of sites that use this capability. Um, we see the web uh, service workers used for push messaging and not, not a lot else. Um, but um, the premise there is that you have some sort of online connectivity with an origin before you, you have any ability to go offline. Um, but there are emerging drivers now for real offline solutions. So we have uh, a ton of people who aren't online much, and that's uh, much, of, much of the world, unfortunately. Um, and there's also this interest in new content delivery methods. And here we're talking about things like AMP and whatnot. Next, please. So the basic problem is that um, we want to enable content to arrive by some method other than a TLS connection to the origin. And we want to make that content usable from that point without having gone online. And well, there goes Sean. Um, if at some point that person comes online again in the future, then um, we want the content to be more usable. I mean, obviously, if you're offline, there's a bunch of things you cannot do. And uh, it would be nice if those things were, were then available using all of the context that you might have built up while you were offline. So think about that in terms of I've got an email client and I can compose some emails to send to people that then get sent when I return online. Uh, next page. So the basic problem here that we're dealing with is um, that stuff that you do while offline will accumulate state. And um, that, that state is what we're going to be talking about here as being important. Um, the web's for communications primarily. And um, we have to assume that if we're using the web and these, these things are, are web applications or, or websites, when we're using them offline, it means that we want to come and do some communication at some later point. Uh, it doesn't make a whole lot of sense to have essentially uh, this be a, a, an application delivery platform with no future possibility of online communication. We already have plenty of alternatives in that space. Um, so when we talk about the, the possibility of future communication, we have to consider what the effects of actions with that bundle are. Um, 
while you're offline have on the uh, later online state. So um, next page. So as Jeffrey talked about, the authority question is kind of key to this. Um, and if someone can't connect, how do we how do we connect this online notion of authority to the, the notion that we have here of um, offline something or other? Uh, Jeffrey talked about using signatures. I don't know that that's entirely necessary, but um, that certainly has some some value. Um, and I'll probably get back to the point about the difference between what we tell people the origin is and what we tell uh, uh, what we consider the authority to be. And that's something that we're, we're just working through now on the list, I think. Next page. So obviously there's a bunch of things that we absolutely lose during the offline transition. Uh, Jeffrey talked about a bunch of other things that are a little less obvious that we lose as a consequence of having a design like this. And one of those things might be the, yeah, I'm, I'm really sorry about the phone thing. Um, <laughs> um, the, um, and now Joe, thank you. You've, you've lost me. Um, and so uh, things like constructing the bundle has to has to be done in such a way as you lose uh, certain personalization properties because bundles will be potentially shipped to multiple people. And uh, having personal information in bundles is something that we have to be careful to avoid. Um, and obviously, while you're offline, you can't do things like communicate with other people and, and talk to servers, that sort of thing. There's a bunch of other questions about how much we can afford to sacrifice um, Jeffrey talked about uh, what it is that we display in the, the page in terms of origin. Um, and there's a bunch of really hard questions there that, that need, need some consideration. So next page, I think I might skip over this a little bit. This is essentially my um, one page summary of, of the signed exchanges thing. You take a bunch of stuff, you sign it, and then it becomes part of a real online origin. Uh, there's a bunch of problems with that potentially, but that's, um, that's where it's at. And next slide so it goes through some of these. It's hard to know what's safe to sign. Uh, we have a potential diversification of the, the way in which we determine what authority means. Um, and Jeffrey talked about this a little bit as well. Um, because we diversify it, we potentially weaken what it means to have authority, and there's a bunch of things that you have to do in order to to, to work through that. Um, uh, the revocation status and and so forth is quite quite challenging. Uh, one of the, uh, the major problems I identified there was that content has this this limited lifetime. Uh, I think we're talking about seven days, which actually in practice turns into quite a usable um, a usability problem in the sense that you can't have offline content that's good for very long because of things like clock skew and, and various other padding. You only have a couple of days worth of, of usage. Um, there's a bunch of other minor things that go along with that as well. But anyway, um, to the proposal. Next slide. So um, the idea is to give content its own origin distinct from the online origin that it might aspire to be part of and uh, distinct from the origin that may have delivered that content. Uh, the bundles have to identify the target origin. Uh, there's some, a bunch of reasons why you might want to do that sort of thing. And um, at the time when you come online again or you decide to come online, because um, some of these things are uh, discretionary rather than simply a, a consequence of not having an internet connection. Um, you ask the target origin whether it wants to automate, it wants to accept the um, the content, and it can reject that, which is an important thing. Next slide, please. 
So this is obviously very drafty and sketchy, but you would say um, give a bundle a new type of origin. I used the uh, named information uh, URI scheme here because that was already available. But obviously there's a bunch of other ways we could, we could slice this up. But uh, here we have a different type of origin and browsers know how to deal with origins so we can treat this like any other origin. Uh, the content could even make HTTP requests. Although if you are truly offline, then that's unlikely to work. And you can associate uh, state with all of these things and whatnot. So you can access all of the standard APIs uh, with these things. Okay, next please. So in designating a target, um, the bundle identifies where it wants its information to go and um, it then initiates a transfer to that to URL. And so the browser fetches that URL, asks that URL, it essentially issues a challenge. And if the, the site answers the challenge correctly, then it, the site navigates to that uh, online origin but takes along with it all of the state and all of the content that was contained in the bundle. So anything that's been built up over time would, would go along with that transition. So if you're, you had composed an email to send, that, that email would then be available to send. And the, the online origin or the target origin can actually send the email for you because now you're online. Next, please. So um, the draft has this concept of aliasing origins because we now have potentially multiple bundles that are in, in play. Um, this, I think, sort of emerged organically from the design. I don't know that this is something that I'm committed to, but um, it seemed like a neat way to solve some of the problems. Essentially, um, when you when you have a transfer from the offline thing to the online thing, the origin that you had previously now becomes an alias for the for the thing that was um, it was transferring information to, and so that allows you to do things like well, if people were previously talking to the offline origin, then those messages will be seamlessly routed to the online version of the same. I don't know if this, this is absolutely necessary, but it seemed convenient. Uh, yes, uh, next page, please. So um, there are two ways in which you might fail to transition. Um, if you fail a transfer, that, um, that is because you're offline or the server gives you a server failure error or something along those lines, then the, the content and all the state associated with it just sort of remains in the offline origin that you had in the content. Uh, but if the server fails the challenge um, and returns a positive response to your request but doesn't provide you with a, a clear indication that it understands the, the request that you made of it, then um, what happens is that all of the state that you might want to transfer doesn't transfer and you just navigate to the to the target URL uh, and lose any of that continuity and that allows a server to reject the things that were present in the in the bundle so uh, let's say you had a situation where the bundle had some JavaScript that turned out to have a cross-site request forgery bug in there uh, you discover that the server can in the future then say, I don't want to accept that content. And by rejecting that, it doesn't expose itself to any of the problems that that, that script might have caused, problems that an attacker might have exploited as a result of that. Next page, please. So there's a bunch of limitations here. Um, I think we're going to talk through some of the, the more difficult ones. Um, probably the, the more interesting one is that uh, content isn't really attributed to uh, an origin that people understand. Um, that is only a potential 
the, the target origin is, is potential only. And that means that you can't do things like show that target in the URL bar. You can't say that this is a particular website, example.com. You have some sort of opaque gibberish that you want to show someone, uh, which doesn't really work from a us usability perspective. Um, the transition to online takes a round trip. If you look at the, the signed exchanges proposal, one of the advantages, I guess, is that um, in particularly the AMP use case, you have a distributor can take a bundle of content, give that to you, you render it all up, and they say go, and the transition to something that looks to be online is virtually immediate. There's no um, back and forth to the server, whereas this requires that you go back to, to the server. Uh, the state transfer stuff is kind of non-trivial. Um, particularly when you consider the possibility for a particular target origin to have multiple bundles outstanding. So you have a bundle for every music, news article on, on a site and if every single one of them had state accumulated with that, um, merging all of that information is quite challenging. And there's probably a bunch of other things that I haven't thought of. Uh, and there's a few other things in the draft. Next slide, please. So just to go through the, the AMP case in a little bit more detail, uh, you can imagine that, um, uh, sorry, let's, let's back up a little bit. AMP, AMP works by um, your, you visit a distributed page. They have a link or a bunch of links to, to content from other sites, but they don't want those other sites to be communicated with. Um, they essentially tell the, the browser not to communicate with those sites, but they provide them with a bundle of content that is for those sites. Um, the browser can then do things like pre-rendering that content and um, building it up. And if you look at the way that the um, content origins work actually proposes this, this work is those, those things would operate in an offline origin by choice for the, for the purposes of preparing that content for, for display. Um, but this is a very short period of time because once someone clicks on the link and follows into that offline origin, the transfer to an online origin would then be effectively immediate. So the state accumulation problem isn't so much of a big deal in this case. We only have to worry about the um, the transition to, to being a, in an online origin. So there, there might be a one round trip time while you talk to the server and, and check things, but it would immediately then flip across to the target origin. So in a sense, this case is much easier to handle um, than having a fully offline experience, but um, there are a bunch of usability problems to go along with that one. I think that's all the slides I had. If we go to the next one, we have a nice pattern and that's all. And um, I think we'll open the floor to questions. Yeah, don't worry about that slide. We'll get into that later. Okay, uh, Larry Massinger, please. <clears throat> Can you hear me? Yes, we hear you. Good. Um, I'm interested in some other use cases, like take the example of PDF. You get a package of things that are intended for rendering. Of course, it has a paged imaging model, uh, which is inappropriate for the web. But otherwise, you could take some clue from a, P a PDF file when you send it to someone. You are the person, maybe you gathered a, the information from a web page you want it to be laid out dynamically at the client, at the recipient side. But what you're signing is the, uh, when you sign a PDF file, you're signing the presentation of the package rather than just some individual transaction. And so I think that carries over into this use case. Yeah, I don't see PDF as being, uh, needing any particularly special mechanism, but it's, um... An no, no, I'm saying that the, yep. the, the, the use case that is currently for PDF of taking a web page and archiving it, uh, or taking a web page and signing it as their final version, 
and that that would be an interesting kind of replacement. Thanks, Larry. And the other the other thing is that if people do this with data colon you or URL, they have uh, data that they want to be part of the package, and I'd like to see this as exclusively the goal to obsolete. And just to think through, what is the origin of a data? It should be the same as the origin of the original content in which it's embedded. Oh, that's that's an interesting question. I'm not up to speed on on how those are handled in the web, but I think that's that's worth looking into. Thanks. And then two other use cases that I'm not sure are, are as quite as strong. Well, the multi-part related for MHTML and multi-part form data for file uploads uh, there are other instances of packaging that you want packaging to be whatever WPAC does should be able to obsolete those. Anyway, that's it. Thank you. Thank you, Larry. Uh, Mark Nottingham, please. Hi, can you hear me? Yeah. I hear you. One round trip. Okay. Um, so in my incredibly simplistic brain, I think of web packaging as, okay, you, you package something up and you hand it to someone and you extend its lifetime where it can be used by signing it and you get seven days. And then you can extend that by more time later on up to seven days. Um, and then this one, I hand you something and it, it is magically given a separate identity in that transfer uh, where it's, it's you know, hash based. And then if I want to associate it back with the origin, it's again, you know, I, I do some magic and then I can flip it over and it's part of that origin. Uh, and then I think that's at a very, very high level about right. And I guess yep. what's interesting to me about all of this is that both of these kind of feel like something which I'm more familiar with, which is web caching. And in web caching, I can still use a resource even if I'm not immediately connected to something because I've done it before and I had an explicit cache lifetime. Um, now, I can't hand all my cache contents to you, Martin, and you, you know, then be able to use them as if it came from the origin, but I'm still using it without a direct you know, connection to the origin and that's, that's authenticated by TLS. Um, and so the observation that I, I guess I'm getting to is that in the caching world, one thing we've found is, is that choosing a TTL is really hard um, and people get it wrong a lot and it has a lot of effects on how not only performance but availability and a lot of other things. And that's at the granularity of a single resource. And both of these solutions do it at the granularity of a whole bundle of resources. So I'm just experiencing fear. Um, that, that, that's all. This this is the the fear of of the work of the working group. I'm afraid, Mark. Uh, yes, <laughs> I share that fear. So, uh, comforting hugs all around, and Ben Schwartz. Hi, this is Ben Schwartz. Uh, I wanted to first say that a lot of the security problems you're talking about at least sound like they are solved by a distributor whitelisting of some sort. Um, that is, if you're worried about things like the uh, stolen key attacks, uh, if you uh, if you can make a, a long-term delegation to, or or trust assertion to a distributor, that might uh, that might help solve that. Uh, the other comment I'll make is. It seems like this. It might be possible to do this state transfer as a cross-origin post to the target origin, and essentially handle the rest of the state transfer entirely in uh, application logic. Uh, and if you don't want to actually post all of the state across the wire, maybe the target origin can have a service worker that takes it locally. Yeah, that's um, that's an interesting suggestion, Ben. I, I did seriously contemplate that approach, but um, one of the things that's come out in the discussions is that uh, there's there's a lot of case, cases where you can just do things like take uh, an index DB database and drop it across, and you don't have to put special code in the, the origin to handle that case. I was using 
database X. I continue to use database X after the transfer. That's fine. I know that no one else, no other bundles or no other resources on this on this origin will be mucking with that content. So this is this is safe for me to do. Uh, it gets a little more interesting when you have multiple potential bundles interacting with the same database, which is why the the, the transfer exists. But yes, it does have some some complexities involved. Glad you got your mic working, Ben. On to Watson Lab. Hello, uh, Watson Lab from CloudFlare. Uh, so I think you really can punt on the state issue somewhat. If you provide the mechanism to get the state and know what bundle made it, then the application developer can decide is this too old to merge or is it still mergeable either server side or client side, depending on how they're doing that already. The other thing is, with terms of layering, I think you really want this. Because if you have a web application where you have some JavaScript that's really setting everything up, and then you have another layer of JavaScript and CSS that's display, then a change to the display shouldn't, you might, you probably don't want that to affect the validity of data stored in the lower layer. So I think if just for making sort of cosmetic changes, you really, you really would like layering to be easy. Thanks, Wilson. Uh, you are voice, please. Um, just a question regarding the, so since the origin is hash-based, does that mean we have to process the entire bundle before we know what the origin is? And right. So um, that's a good question, Yoff. One of the things that I'd imagine doing here was using the progressive um, hash-based um, stuff that, that Jeffrey and I have been working on. Um, he says it's my work. I say that um, he's allowed to claim that as well, um, which, which essentially says that you, you can use one of the, um, you can use the advertised hash of the content um, prior to mm. actually knowing the whole content and receiving the entire bundle. Uh, obviously, you need to validate that, but um, you, you can potentially do that as well. Okay, thanks. And then uh, Eric Chris Cortla, please. Uh, howdy. Um, so, um, uh, Martin, I guess, I guess um, you know, I, I admire the purity of this proposal. Um, um, uh, I think offline, I, I emailed you a sort of um, hybrid proposal um, that's. Um, uh, where things are named not by content hashes but by um, signature, but by signature keys. Um, um, the, 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 I think that has some of the properties of each of these proposals. Um, in particular, it allows you to like you know it allows you to upgrade the um, uh, to to, uh, to, to, get, to maintain to maintain state across packages as are upgraded. Um, um, but then it, but then it has some of the same um, compromised properties. Uh, unfortunately, compromised process properties that signing has. So um, I think it's great to have these two examples on either side of it. But I just wanted to float that like there's an intermediate example that has you know, you know, you know, you know linear combination of the two properties that one might imagine thinking was good or might not. Yeah. So uh, I think we're going to get into that into the next in the next. Um, oh, great. I didn't. As well. I didn't see it in Jeffrey's slides, but maybe I just missed it. Yep. Uh, it, it has always been my intent to to sort of show this as the as the extreme position, and I just didn't have time to write up the alternative. But I obviously think that um, some of the properties of the signing side of this is is quite interesting. Certainly, not to blame you. I was too lazy to write it up myself. <laughs> <laughs> Ed Hardy, please. Uh, Ed Hardy, peer to peer enthusiast. Uh, so I, I really like a lot of some of what this is doing. Um, as I put into the chat, I think. That there are definitely cases here uh, where this could be useful either uh, in the presence of signatures, like uh, the sign bundles as they are now, or uh, to move from kind of a context where you have something which is not signed and be able to treat it as signed, um, and kind of joining those two contexts would be quite useful. Um, I don't think I see the trade-off this is making and that we discussed on the list uh, as eliminating the need for signed bundles. I think we, we have in our charter, the ability to receive a web package from an entity other than the origin server and have a uh, continuity of experience in state as kind of a key goal here. And for me, that's always meant uh, that you be able to do this uh, in a way where that continuity of state 
um, merges with state that's already there. And I think we kind of motivated that on the list uh, Ben did with a simple example, and I did with a much more dire one. Um, but I'm I'm really interested to to hear whether you're 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 willing to pursue this, even if we also continue to go forward with signed exchanges, because I personally think that would be useful. But it's not clear to me whether you think this is a, is a pure alternative or just another contribution to the set of possible outcomes. I, I don't think this is necessarily exclusively an an alternative to to what Jeffrey has proposed. I, I think this is just yeah, eliminating some of the other opportunities that we have for, for things in this space. I'm going to have to come come back to that discussion we had on the list. I, I think there are some, some interesting pitfalls that that creates, that um, taking an approach that's more toward this end of the, the space might avoid. So I, I think there's probably a, a bunch more iteration we have to do on the on the discussion there. I'm particularly interested in, in the question of how we how we take um, attribution and um, continuity and, and think about those things, but perhaps as separate concepts. I, I really appreciate your willingness to engage in that iteration, and I agree with you that that's uh, going to be a key piece to this. The, the way I think about this, and, and there are 107 people on, on the WebEx, so certainly somebody hasn't heard me natter about this in the past, is that with uh, this system in place, you get the consequence that the web can continue when the internet is withdrawn. And that's something that, you know, the, the references to the other bundle project and DTNs uh, uh, aside is a really interesting thing for those of us who care a lot about your peer, peer, peer uh, use cases. And uh, in particular, given that the, the possibility that the internet is withdrawn and in in, in consequence of something outside the user's control, not just they didn't turn on their, their cellular their network. Uh, so I would really like us to, to distinguish between cases where um, that maybe isn't the primary goal, but is still something we can support um, with a little bit more work, um, and cases where for some security or other trade-off, we simply can't support it at all. And I, I appreciate your willingness to iterate on that. Yeah, I, I think this is a really interesting space to be working in. One of the reasons why I hadn't thought so much about the internet is, is withdrawn being um, something that this working group was, was interested in is that we, we sort of have a self-service option for that one uh, in, in service workers. I'm not sure that I'm especially happy with that solution and, and uh, adoption of that particular capability sort of indicates that other people aren't either. So I'm certainly willing to talk about it. Okay, uh, just a quick note that we only have 16 minutes left in this session and still one more 10 minute presentation from Martin and Jeffrey. Uh, and then we had 50 minutes of discussion at the end, but we're not gonna have that full amount of time. Uh, Devin and DKG, oh, DKG just took himself out of the queue. Um, but Devin, if you could please make it kind of quick so that we can get uh, Jeffrey and Martin's last preso in. Hi. Yeah. Can you hear me? Um, this is Devin Mullins. I just want to add two nuances. Uh, one is the um, AMP is the, the concept that AMP is sort of offline by choice uh, for a little bit is mostly true, but I guess it's it, uh, for resources that don't require the, um, the authoritative origin, they could kind of erase the state transfer request. Um, and, and the other one, a comment is that the uh, comment that um, like, because the index D, uh, DB migration of the database X doesn't exist in the authoritative, authoritative space, that it would be safe to just drop it there. I don't think that would be true uh, for arbitrary and for arbitrary content. There is the potential that kind of databases X and Y could conflict in the JavaScript application, though I certainly don't know of any kind of specific cases of that. Yeah, yeah that's, that's a good comment and something we'd have to work through, I, I suspect. All right, so we're switching gears to the um, to a comparison of the two. I guess we should really preface this to say that, as you can tell from the discussion, that the the, the two proposals are working together, and so it's not necessarily um, true that we're going to have a beauty contest. I think we're actually trying to avoid that, and I guess I appreciate uh, both the authors willing to work together. So 
I'm not sure how Jeffrey and Martin, how you guys want to divvy this up, but you guys just want to tell me next slide and I'll do that. Yeah, I think I think I'm going to do most of the talking here, but um, Martin is welcome to to jump in and we'll both answer questions and stuff. Um, <clears throat> so yeah, as um, as Sean said, this is not kind of an either or question. Um, I think these are complementary approaches, and that we will eventually wind up taking some pieces of each. Um, so to to recap, um, with a signer origin, the content gets its origin based on who signs it. With a content origin, it's it's based on the hash of its bytes, and then some online origin might adopt it later. Next slide. Um, so there's some risks that are shared by both approaches. Um, we don't want an online origin to adopt personalized content, including cookies. Um, that can cause uh, a set of, of problems that are described in the signed exchanges draft. Um, and you have, to, you have to bundle a set of resources together to avoid an attacker skewing the versions to, to break the site and, and get something that, that they shouldn't have. Next slide. Um, so each approach is good at some things and compensates for some of the things the other approach doesn't do as well. Next slide. Um, so uh, signed origins don't handle liveness very well. Um, they give you that, that up to seven day uh, window in which something might have been revoked. Um, whereas uh, content origins by, by getting a real time vouch, um, they, they get you, they, uh, they solve that problem. Um, and so if we, instead of giving things a pure signer origin, maybe signatures could expire with, with a longer time frame um, to give kind of a, a human understandable notion of where something came from without, without letting attackers take advantage of it. Um, next slide. Um, upgrades are a problem for content origins. Um, as I think Ecker pointed out, um, it's hard to, uh, to say that the, the version I'm gonna release next week uh, should be able to be an upgrade for the version I released today um, because you don't know the next week's version's uh, hash. Um, whereas with a signature, you, you can say that I trust this signer to get my data and then um, when it comes back online, we'll check with the, with the liveness check I mentioned in the previous slide. Um, so, so signatures are, are probably an important addition to the content origins. Um, next slide. Um, then we have the question of what URL to display. As Martin described, a content origin is not human readable. It's that NI garbage. Um, and, uh, and a signature from some human understandable signer uh, gives you something to put in the URL bar. Um, I believe Martin may have something to add here about um, some details of, of how we decide to trust things. Um, it's not obvious that that kind of a seven day old signature is, is, uh, is definitely what you want to describe in the URL bar. Um, yeah, so uh, I think probably the most important thing here is that um, when, we, when we do something like a hash based origin or an origin based on a signature key as what, what Eka suggested is that's not human readable or usable in any way. Um, but there's, there's a distinction between the uh, concept of the um, of the origin that the browser has in mind and, and uh, separation of, um, of content and the thing that is displayed to, to the user. And I think we can, we can explore the, the separation of those states. One of the things that Firefox has had for a long time that's kind of unique in the browser world is this concept of extended attributes on, on origins, um, which allows us to segregate off content from ostensibly the same origin um, into different different compartments, if you will, and so that's a that's a powerful concept. I I think might inform some of the designs eventually. Yep. So next slide has a, a summary of of this presentation and how we how I thought we might mix the two proposals, um, but let's open the floor to to discussion. Okay, actually, uh, this uh, will be our wrap up discussion. We do have 10 minutes left in the session. And at the moment, only Eric is in the queue. Eric is please. Howdy. Um, so I think I understand the first two columns here. Do you, would you mind walking through this slide? 
Yeah. So um, with to solve the problem of liveness, um, it'd be nice to, to use content origins for it. The reason I, I mentioned if content origins work is because the state transfer is complicated and we'll have to we'll have to figure out how to design it. Um, for upgrades, uh, the signatures are are key. Um, so we we need to do something that that involves identifying a signer who who is allowed to to get the, the origins data. Um, and then uh, for URL display, um, I think that we'll want to show something based on the signer's origin in the URL bar. Did that make sense? Uh, um, well, I, I think I understood the first two. The first two made that, that lined up that I was expecting. The last one, I think I'm a little confused on. Um, so, I mean, I think in, I mean, like in my hypothetical world. So, I guess, I guess, like, let's just, uh, let's try to walk through these. And please feel free to tell me, like, if anybody else gets on the line, I'll just shut up. But since we have nine minutes, um, um, I mean, it seems to me that in signed exchange is what happens. Uh, thanks, DKJ. I'll, I'll think about two minutes then. Um, um, the inside exchange is what happens is you always show like the the the, the, the origin of the signer, right? Um, right. And in um, uh, um, I, I'm, I'm going to pretend for the moment we're still showing URLs, even though I hear people want to remove them. Um, the um, in 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 the, in, the, in the content version in the sort of intermediate stage, you have kind of problem because you can like you know when it's not been adopted, you show some garbage, right? Or you show nothing or something. And when it's been adopted, you show the adopted thing, right? Are, are we on the right. same page there? Okay. Yes. Um, so I, I think I think those are like the only possible, as far as I can tell, that's like the only possible way you could like implement like the the uh, the content, you know, either I, either of the sort of content, whether it's signing or signing or non-signing content ones, um, and like why would you do anything else for like for sign, for the signing changes one? So I think those are right. like, I think those are the I'm, outcomes you get. Yeah. I'm only talking about that intermediate state before you've contacted the origin. And yeah. the question is what what do you show there? Um, and I think signed exchanges have something to, to offer in, in figuring out what to show in that intermediate state. Yeah. Uh, other, once, other, we've, go ahead. once we've checked online, then you should show the online version. Right. I mean, otherwise, I mean, I think for those content recordings, you can like throw up your hands, right? Um, um, one thing I think would be useful to have um, is more than I had a like extended exchange offline um, about this sort of, um, you know, security compromise properties of this, um, which I'm not sure I've reasoned about that that well. Um, so if you guys have something that sort of like compares to sort of like, like effects of host compromise and, and, and key compromise, that'd be helpful. If not, maybe I'll do it. <laughs> we we do not have anything like that yet. Okay. Um well if if, if, if someone posted a list before I do then 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 um they'll it won't do it, but otherwise I'll probably take a try to crack at it because it'd be useful to think about. Because it's, it's quite subtle, I think. Yeah. Okay. Uh, thank you. Daniel Khan Gilmore. This is Daniel Khan Gilmore. Um I am just I, the more I think about this, I, I keep finding weird corners of it, um, which which I find really distressing. But I'm going to zoom way out and just um, one of the use cases that was mentioned was like a like a uh, email program, right? That you fetch as a bundle, you use it in an offline state, and when you reconnect, you're sending messages. And I'm just trying to think through um, what the user experience is there. Um, in the liveness, so say I've composed an email and, I, and I'm going to go send it when I get back online. I get back online and I discover that it is no longer live. It's no longer fresh. Um, what happened to my email that I composed? The, the current sketch says you lose it. Um, I think we'll be able to, uh, to refine that to say that kind of the, the online origin gets, gets some way to recover the state. Um, but it's tricky because that state could be arbitrarily compromised. And so the online origin has to be careful not to be compromised by that, that state. Yeah, that seems like a very delicate process. And then yes. while, I'm, while I'm composing in this offline app, you tell me that instead of where I used to see, uh, you know, my email provider.biz, I'm, I'm now seeing the, the um, janky, incomprehensible, non-human readable content hash. Martin, you want to take this one? Yeah, so this is this is the hard thing. Um, how many people actually look at what's up there? I don't know. Um, Emily Stark had some research on this one that was kind of interesting. Um, well, what, just to be clear, like 
the fact that people don't that, that many people don't use security indicators doesn't mean we should throw away all security indicators. I mean, I'm a big yeah. fan of simplifying things, but to say you had this one handle and now you have zero handles because most people didn't use the handle in the first place seems uh, seems problematic. I'm, I'm not saying I need the full URL, but the origin at the very least is is what people are, you know. Well, you, you need to care about. Yeah, so you need two things. I'm sorry you're bro breaking up, and it may, be, may just be me. Um, but there's, there's really two things here. One is the, the reputation that you attach to the, to the content that you're interacting with. And the other one is understanding where it is the information you're putting in might end up going. And, and those may be separate things, but um, it, both of those are important in this context. Okay. I'm liking some suggestions that are in the Dabber chat right now. They're making me feel a little bit better. Um, one other wrinkle that I wanted to throw in um, is uh, one of the major problems that we've had with DNSSEC, which is another signed records, signed content instead of, um, on, instead of trans um, authentication, is proof of non-existence. And we've bundles and the items within the bundles themselves having URLs. Um, and it's not clear to me if two different bundles could potentially contain resources that are actually the same URL as one another. Um, and you know, the obvious question there when we're looking at upgrades is which one takes precedence. But then you have another question, which is, are we expecting to represent uh, like no such like 404s, for example, in this? I don't have a good answer. I'm sorry. Uh, worth worth taking up later. Thank you. Uh, Mike Bishop, please. Uh, this is Mike Bishop. I was just going to comment on in terms of the origin display. Um, I commented on Jabber. I think probably the most sensible and user understandable thing is to display that it's from the origin as of when it was signed or last validated, and if people are offline and you tell them it's from three weeks ago, they're going to be okay with that because they know they're offline. Um, I also think in terms of the transition to online state, I think it's not just a binary accept reject, but there's also needs to be a yes, that was mine, but it's old. So I would like your state and I would like you to load this other thing. Thank you, Mike. Wendy Seltzer for the last comment, please. Uh, thanks, Wendy Seltzer here. Um, and I, I, I was interested in the, uh, thanks for these uh, presentations. And I'm interested in the sort of tension between sort of control by the, the origin um, and signer uh, and control by the user and um, wondering sort of how far we're shifting away from uh, the end user who wants to do something different from uh, what the, the, the packager uh, intended um, might be able to repurpose uh, the, the archival use case or the uh, anonymous uh, passing on of content. Uh, Just a thought to wrap. And, and, and a thought that's well appreciated. I'm not sure that we have any really good answer to it just yet. Okay. Um, thank you. It's back to Sean for closing comments. Uh, we are at time though. So uh, I will say thank you all for your participation. And uh, Sean gets the last word. Yeah, again, thank you for, for all of your time. Apologies again for me flubbing around with my laptop. Um, I've installed this thing for the next time. Um, let's take it to the list, folks. Thanks a lot. Bye, all. See you at the plenary. Thank you.